Welcome to Our Appalachia. My name is Phil Kahn. I'm your host for this series, and we discuss different parts of the culture, the traditions of the Southern Mountains. We're going to talk about beekeeping in the Southern Mountains today. This is a good time to do so. Of course, bees are hard at work most times of the year, and we're going to talk with Roland Burns, who is a geography professor at Moorhead State University, but I guess one of his major loves is beekeeping. He started beekeeping long ago and is still hard at it. Just to give you a little introduction on Dr. Burns, he finished both baccalaureate degrees and master's degree at Moorhead State University. He did a doctorate at the University of Southern Mississippi and has been here in Moorhead on the faculty for some time. But today we're going to talk about beekeeping, Roland. So tell me when and how you first got interested in beekeeping. I got interested in beekeeping quite a number of years ago, in fact, when I was about 13 years old. I was raised up in uh, the city of Ashland, and uh, when I was just a little fella, I remember talking with, with my grandfather, and he had been into beekeeping, as had my great-grandfather. And then they gave me a bee book, an old beekeeping book, and then I got interested in it from there, and I've been keeping bees off and on ever since. Of course, beekeeping is like most aspects of food production or agricultural pursuits, you might say, and it's been modernized in recent years, and we have scientific or modern approaches. But today, I really want to concentrate on what you might call the old-timey mountain way of raising honey. So let's go all the way back to the settlement of eastern Kentucky and all of the southern mountains. How did people bring bees to the mountains, or did they? Of course, in the beginning, almost any self-respecting farmer had bees. How did he acquire the bees? Well, to go back uh, just a little bit further, uh, the honeybee, as we know it today, was not native to North America. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors that were from Europe, Germany, France, and uh, Britain brought the bees over with them on the sailing ships. I imagine that could have been a very traumatic experience for <laughs> sure. And then the bees and the colonists, later the settlers, uh, came across the Appalachians into Kentucky and they brought the honeybees with them. Again, uh, many times on uh, the backs of wagons and so on, in their little straw skeeps or hives that they had at the time. They just put a little piece of cloth at the entrance and were very careful in moving these things. And of course, swarms escaped from these supposedly captive hives and went into hollow trees, became bee trees at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So there were wild bees that were in the trees in the forest, and there were so-called tame bees that uh, the people, virtually every family, kept mm -hmm. beehives on, the, on their place. But the probability of every farmer bringing bees in a rickety wagon through Pound Gap or through the Cumberland Gap, uh, I don't guess that happened. I guess once bees were established on the eastern coast, bees moved really ahead of settlement. Yes, they found very good foraging in the, in the forest lands, uh, certainly of the Appalachia, mm -hmm. and they escaped, and so a lot of people got their honey supply for their sweetening mm -hmm. uh, from cutting these bee trees. Okay, we talk about wild honey, wild bees. I guess most bees are wild if you get right down to it. I haven't <laughs> yes. found any that won't sting you if <laughs> That's, they're sufficiently I agree. provoked. Yes. Okay, but when we uh, speak of wild honey, we're talking about honey that is made by a hive in a big tree just out in the right. woods. You say that early settlers oftentimes found a tree and just harvested honey that way. Yes. In fact, a lot of people do that even today. Mm -hmm. What type of honey do you generally have in a large tree, though? Would it be many years old? Do bees accumulate honey over many yeah. years? That's, they could be some of the present year's crop, or mm -hmm. it could go back for years. In fact, honey is produced by bees primarily to uh, feed themselves and their young ones, their larval forms. Mm -hmm. So uh, that the, a bee tree may have honey in there that may be 15 or 20 years old if the, if the colony has been living in that tree mm -hmm. that long. A bee colony, though, has no sense of properly programming old honey. In other words, they don't no, use older no. honey before they do new honey. No. They just use whatever it takes to get yeah. through yeah. the winter yes. and try to put up enough to get mm -hmm. through the winter. Well, tell us. you bound to have talked to a lot of old-timers and maybe even robbed some bee trees yourself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> tell us how you go about it. How uh, do you even locate a bee tree for starts, and then how do you go about getting as much honey with as few stings as possible? Yes. Well, it's kind of a long story, but, but kind of briefly, uh, when the bees are out working in the spring or summer or the early fall, when you see them out working on flowers, Many of the old-timers would spot 
a particular bee and watch him, or her technically, as it went from flower to flower. And then when the bee filled up with whatever it was gathering, whether nectar, which is produced, produces or makes into honey, and then or pollen, and then the bee goes on a bee line straight back to where it has its home in the colony. So you these can pretty well tell when they've taken off yes, for home. Uh -huh. They'll they'll make a couple of circles until they get well up in the air. Then they'll take a right straight shot. Mm -hmm. And then after watching for a while, and then be, you begin to get some sense of direction and cross bearings. And these old fellows would find the bee tree and then find a, uh, get with some of their friends and cut the bee tree, and that was quite a trick in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, they would cut the tree. Sometimes the tree would fall through other trees and get hung up. Other times they got it on the ground and it smashed into the ground and broke the tree open. Of course, the tree, almost all of them were hollow. Mm -hmm. The central cavity or the branches were hollow where the bees had their colony or nest. Once the tree hit the ground, then they broke out the wedges and, and broke the, the tree open. Mm -hmm. Of course, then there was sawdust and dead bees and larvae and chunks of wax and mm -hmm. old honey and new honey, and sometimes it was quite a mess. But on some of the larger trees, like sycamores and beech, that were quite large, and they produced literally uh, many gallons of honey that they would fill up big buckets and large containers with to haul mm. off to the house. Mm. Now, when you were robbing a bee tree, though, would you try to smoke the bees or some way uh, calm them down, or you just take your chances? Uh, most of the time, uh, the old timers would use some type of smoke, mm -hmm. whether it would be just a torch that was burning a piece of pitch or some pine or, or whatever. Uh, smoke has a tendency to calm the bees down in that I suppose the bees, if they can think, think their house is on fire or something and they want to gather up all their honey that they can so they're not interested all that much in attacking the, the person that's after the honey. But of course, and many times, particularly with the, what we call the little uh, wild bee, mm -hmm. which is a, a German, technically a German black bee, those little rascals absolutely just eat you up. Mm -hmm. They would just sting and sting and sting and sting. Well, you've already given me real good reason to set up a hive and keep bees because you've described wild honey as having sawdust in it and dead bees <laughs> and 15-year-old honey. I'm already ready to set up right. a hive for the purpose of well, honey or at least resi re rely on some commercial yeah. operation. Yeah. Okay, but at the point you decided you were going to keep bees as opposed to just out foxing them in the woods, how did you go about it in the olden days? For starts, how did you find your bees if you did not have a colony that you had purchased? Frequently in the springtime, about fruit bloom time in April or early May, uh, bee trees, almost all of them, will swarm. That's the, their method of reproduction. Mm -hmm. And they'll swarm, which is the old queen and quite a number of her workers going out. Well, oftentimes these things will hang in trees for two or three days. Mm -hmm. So someone can g walk by or go by and see a swarm hanging out of a tree. Then the old timers would take, uh, <coughs> if the cluster was hanging on a low branch, they would take a straw skeep, which is made out of woven straw, which we used in Europe a thousand years ago, and uh, made a little hole in the bottom of it and just ran the swarm in there. Mm -hmm. And when I say running the swarm, it's literally that. You just knock the swarm down in front of the hive, and the bees will have a tendency to go in this darkened entrance mm -hmm. and to set up a little colony in there. Now, at this point during the swarm, bees aren't particularly hostile, I understand. They're not inclined to sting you. Generally, but if that swarm has been hanging there for three or four days, and they've eaten most of their honey uh, that they brought out of the hive with them, they, I have on several occasions mm -hmm. seen mean swarms. But, uh, now, you pretty much need to try to get a colony of bees, certainly wild bees, we would call them, during a swarm as opposed to by cutting down a bee tree. Is, is it possible to get a clump of bees just by cutting down a tree any time of year? It is, but there are some times that uh, if you want to save the bees out of the tree that you don't cut it. You don't cut a bee tree in uh, December or January or February when they are in somewhat of a hibernation state. Mm -hmm. And the little fellows there will just die out. There's no right. way you can work with them. But so the best bet is to wait for a swarm. In the uh, yes, and or you can cut the bee tree in the spring mm -hmm. if your object is getting the bees. If your object is getting the honey and not worrying about the bees, then you cut it in mm -hmm. August, September, October. We don't have enough time to really talk about the very complex nature of bee work you know, the queen and the workers. Uh, it's fascinating to study bees as social animals. But I think it would be interesting for you to tell us the significance of a queen in a colony.
the queen is in effect the mama of, of almost all, of all new bees. It's all of virtually all the bees in that in that hive. And how do bees manifest their loyalty to a queen? You're talking about swarming when an old queen leaves. Has she been kicked out in effect? Of without getting into a lot of the social details of, of the hive, yes, she is. In fact, uh, they stop feeding her and she shrinks down. At that point, then so she can fly. Mm -hmm. Whereas if she's in normal egg-laying condition, why she's so big with eggs that she cannot fly mm -hmm. at all. So they starve her down and then literally push her out, and she flies off with. Mm. Or half to three fourths of the colony at that point in time, leaving back in the old hive, the old bee tree or slab log bee gum, mm -hmm. or wherever they happen to be uh, housed, uh, a young queen that has yet to emerge mm -hmm. and then to take over the queen as the queen of that particular so colony. Although you have tremendous solidarity, loyalty within a hive, there is a point at which there's kind of a riff and some leave and yeah. others stay and right. life goes on. Uh -huh. Let's talk about different types of southern mountain honey. I didn't realize until I began talking to you about bees some years ago, the various crops of honey. I knew that you could get orange blossom honey from Florida and buckwheat honey from the Midwest, but I didn't realize that you not only have different tastes, different colors, but that these tie to different blooms and a good beekeeper knows how to work different blooms, different right. types a year. Let's look at the three honeys we have here, and you might describe for our audience what this particular light honey is. That, uh, the floral source there is from the American linden tree, or basswood, locally known as lin mm -hmm. honey. Uh, it's, uh, the wood is, of, is very valuable for the sawmill people, and they cut out almost all of the early basswood stands. Mm -hmm. so there are a few places in eastern Kentucky that, uh, in Appalachia, that still have enough of the linden tree or lind tree to produce a significant amount of honey. That particular sample there came from Pike County in the far mm. eastern part of the state of Kentucky. Now, when does the lind tree bloom? In it's the... in late spring, early summer. What other types of light honey would you find in the southern mountains? The sourwood tree, which is a small little deciduous tree, uh, looks about the size of a dogwood usually a little undergrowth kind of tree, produces a honey that ranges in between the Lynn honey and this uh, Spanish needle honey that's there in the middle. Right. Uh, it is supposed to be the best honey that's produced in the eastern part of the United States, and the sourwood tree only occurs in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. It uh, commands a premium price, usually somewhere in the vicinity of 5 to $8 a quart, um, and most of it is consumed in Appalachia. Right. We see it at roadside stands frequently in North Carolina, Virginia, and Eastern you Kentucky, bet Tennessee. You bet. The ecstasy of eating sourwood honey is, has been mentioned in song and poetry yes. and a little yes. bit of everywhere. I tell you, though, when we see a light honey like this, which a lot of people prefer in the grocery store, like Sue B or whatever, yes, uh -huh. uh, it's ordinarily not even from a mountain bloom, though, is it? No. It's ordinarily no, from no. what? Clover? White clover from Iowa, South Dakota, Kansas, okay. Nebraska. But a light mountain honey would be Lynn, sourwood. There are some very good yeah. native yes. Appalachian light honeys. Mm -hmm. Let's jump here to this medium grade, kind of oranges or amber. And you call that Spanish needle? Yes, that uh, comes from a little flower that blooms uh, on the edges of Appalachia all the way up into the eastern counties. And it comes from a little weed plant that's a member of the sunflower family. Mm -hmm. It looks like an all orangish yellow daisy. Mm -hmm. It grows in swampy and wet places along fence rows and so on. Mm -hmm. I've seen quite a bit of it over near uh, in Breathitt County. There's right a great deal in nor northeastern Kentucky though, isn't yes, there? I've seen quite huge fields of mm -hmm. Spanish needle in this area. And that uh, is, according to our Licking Valley Beekeepers Association, our club members have voted that our favorite of all the honey that's produced in this eastern Kentucky region. In terms of taste or the fact yes. that it's distinctively from this area? Yes, it's uh, a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very much a local honey. Uh, rarely do you ever see it on the market mm -hmm. outside of the region in which it's produced also. Mm -hmm. Now that is a late fall bloom? Yes, it blooms right about late Labor summer. Day. It's late summer, about Labor Day weekend. Okay. Usually in, uh, okay. blooming about that time. What are some other fall blooms? Aren't there other plants that get thrown into what you might be calling Spanish needle honey? We have a tremendous number of fall flowers, ranging from this little fall aster, mm -hmm. which ranges from white to purple and blooms on hillsides all over eastern Kentucky. 
uh, it blooms all the way even past the first two or three real heavy frost mm -hmm. periods. It produces a honey that uh, frequently uh, the bees do not have time to ripen before winter sets on. Mm -hmm. So you don't see it very often. The early aster you may have included in that. Mm -hmm. There's a Joe Pie weed, iron weed mm -hmm. that's growing on abandoned pasture lands. Of course, goldenrod, of which there's dozens of different varieties, several of which are excellent honey producers. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are producing honey for the purpose of selling it, how picky do you have to be at keeping a fragrance, a variety of honey pure, though? Well, the bees will pretty much do that themselves. In other words, they will prefer one crop over another yes. if it's in great abundance. Uh -huh. So they actually isolate different types of honey in different parts of the hive? As it comes in, they will store it. If, a good example of that would be uh, there are literally a dozens, hundreds of different varieties of apples. Mm -hmm. They could all be bloom, blooming at the same time and the bees will go after the nectar that's produced in the flowers that has the highest sugar content. All day. So very frequently the yellow delicious apple is, isn't particularly desirable. So if there's very few bees in an area, the bees will work everything but the yellow delicious apple. So bees are very selective in what they want. They'll go to what is the best bargain, so to they speak. They don't necessarily agree with the beekeeper. No, no, not okay, at all. They'll work what they're inclined <laughs> to work. Yeah. I've heard, though, of wildflower honey. Now, what kind of honey is that? Is that just that, a nondescript mixture? That could be just whatever the beekeeper can't recognize. It may be a mixture of all three of these here and goldenrod and, and other varieties that are all tossed into one pot, so to speak. Let's look through this very dark honey. What in the world is that? That looks almost like sorghum molasses. Just about the same color. Mm -hmm. That comes from the tulip poplar tree, which mm -hmm. is very common all over Appalachia. It's a very desirable wood for uh, building purposes, for siding on houses and other things. Um, the, it's called tulip poplar because the bloom that comes in late May and early June is about the size of a tulip. It's orange and yellow. Mm -hmm. And um, according to the authorities, the tul each one of these tulip blooms can produce as much as a teaspoon of honey. Mm -hmm. So some of these very large tulip poplar trees can literally produce gallons of honey. An average crop of the tulip poplar honey in eastern Kentucky, uh, east Tennessee, may be as much as 100 pounds per colony. Hmm. The record is held, I understand, by a beekeeper in Elliott County, Kentucky, over here next to us, which uh, his bees in one hive gathered over 500 pounds be. of tulip popper honey there. And of course the tulip popper is very common in all of the southern yes. mountains, I yes. suppose. So this is one of the major honeys so far as commercial possibilities in eastern Kentucky. Absolutely. What type of use would you make, though, of that honey, which is a bit stronger and certainly has more uh, what should I say, more heavy feel to it. Yes. Uh -huh. What uh, kind of things would you use tulip poplar honey for? Quite a bit of the tulip poplar honey is used as a table honey for sweetening mm -hmm. and has been used for years and years. Uh, back in the old days when virtually every farm house in a rural area had three or four hives uh, sitting on the hillside behind the house, the tulip poplar honey, the dark honey, was, was the most common they gather, gathered by their bees, and the people would, would use that. Today, uh, it's not a particularly desirable table honey by an awful lot of people. Uh, the biggest use commercially is by bakeries. Folks have more refined taste and want more delicate honeys, I guess, for table use. Now. Well, we've had a massive education program in the United States, it seems, that uh, people go to the local grocery store, and if they don't see it as Sue B right. or Stoller's honey right. from up in Ohio. It's clover honey. It's not honey. That same trend, of course, explains why a lot of people can't handle sorghum molasses. It's too heavy. Yeah. It has too high sulfur content. And I guess this honey does have a high mineral and ash content. Yes, it does. And uh, supposedly, it's a lot better for an individual person if he's into Health natural wise. foods. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. Well, you know, that's a good point you've made. Uh, in the olden days, let's say even 50 years ago, certainly 100 years ago, mountain farmers weren't necessarily into being connoisseurs when they used honey. They certainly weren't health food enthusiasts as we know them today. Okay, so the fact that they had honey and used honey is pretty much because that was the sweetener. Right. When did honey use as a day-to-day -day affair start disappearing and why? Why don't we have 
hives on every farm nowadays? Well, there's several reasons. Uh, as you mentioned, the old timers, virtually every uh, house had two or three hives of bees, mostly in slab hives or an old hollow gum tree, okay. a sweet gum tree. Now, you know, old timers even talk, call modern hives, even those made of plastic, yeah. they call them bee gums. Right. So you're telling me what a bee gum is, where that comes from? From a gum tree that was, these gum trees, once they get very large, very frequently became hollow in the center. Okay. So, so the term bee gum comes, comes from, from a, gum a tree. day when you literally took a section of hollow log right. and that was your hive. That was the gum, yes. Okay. Go ahead uh, then and tell me about uh, raising so, honey bee gums. Uh, the old timers used to uh, use these bee gums or just take slabs of logs, nail four slabs together put a bottom on it and drill a hole in the side of it so the bees could uh, go in and out and a lid on top but underneath the lid several inches down was a, a cross member two pieces of stick that went across like so mm -hmm. bees have the characteristic of wanting to store their honey as far away from the entrance where other bees or critters might try to get in after it right. up in the top so when a person wanted to rob his bees, they'd just take a hammer or a rock, knock the lid off, and then go in there with his big wash pan and take a big butcher knife or something, cut him a big chunk of honey, because if the bees had any honey at all, it would be right up there next to the lid. Mm -hmm. So they could cut down to the cross pieces, mm -hmm. and the rest of the combs wouldn't fall out. The cross pieces would hold mm -hmm. up there, then he'd put the lid back on and tell the bees to fill it up again. And at this time, the beekeeper didn't even have the frames that we no, have no, today. No, it was just uh, a mass of honey. Right. Okay. But the honey was nevertheless good, mm -hmm. and uh, they thrived on it very nicely. Mm -hmm. But we were talking about the fact that folks prefer granulated sugar now. That was just not available, I don't guess, 50, 100 years ago. Not Is that correct? to most people living in isolated communities in large portions of Appalachia. And two, uh, beekeeping, uh, today we say it's a honey of a hobby and all that, but as you very well know, bees sting. Mm -hmm. Right, I And it's a lot more convenient for most people to go to the now local grocery store mm -hmm. and buy a five-pound bag of sugar mm -hmm. rather than to go up on the hillside behind the house and get stung. Mm -hmm. And just convenience sake, I can remember as just a boy uh, going over portions of eastern Kentucky with my family and seeing back in the, the uh, early, middle, and late 1940s uh, beehives, old log gums, up on the hills behind the houses, right. and you can travel over eastern Kentucky a number of miles today without mm -hmm. seeing any beehives. In fact, there are so few bees, because so few farmers keep them, that if you're trying to raise a large crop of cucumbers or anything else that needs a lot of cross-pollination, you almost have to buy hives of bees or borrow them to even get good cross-pollination yeah. anymore. Some crops, particularly cucumbers. That's I exactly guess 50, right. 100 years ago, that was completely unnecessary. You had enough bees that that took care of itself. Yeah. Let's talk real quickly about the critters you mentioned that like to fiddle with bees. Yeah. Now, you have a lot of bees. How many hives do you have? Uh, 78 or 79 hives in five counties at okay. the present time. So you're big time. <laughs> I wish uh, we could discuss all that. but. What type of critters do you have to cope with nowadays and in olden days? We've, of course, heard uh, many tales of the bear's inclination to, to go for beehives or bee trees, but what are some of the practical problems in keeping critters away? Oh, the, at the present time, uh, probably the skunk is, is the honoriest one of the bunch. They mm -hmm. like to eat the adult bees, and they usually raid a beehive at night and go up to the entrance of it and scratch on the front. Mm -hmm. The bees will come out to investigate in the warm weather and the skunk will just sit there and eat his fill until one stings him inside the mouth or down the throat someplace and oftentimes at that point he'll fire his spray and uh, there's hardly a week that's gone by so far this spring that I haven't smelled a skunk mm -hmm. uh, out in my home uh, beehive area mm -hmm. so far this year but they're generally not much of a problem they won't, won't turn over the hives right. or anything like that they're more just a nuisance than anything. Be, uh, uh, bees then uh, are the food of skunks. They're right. insect eaters. They're not, they're after not the really after the honey at all. No. Mm -hmm. Then there's uh, what we call the bee martin or the kingbird. Mm -hmm. He eats adult bees that fly over. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's the dragonflies. In some areas in swampy portions, why the dragonflies can be a real problem, but that's not mm -hmm. generally in eastern Kentucky. Then traditionally the <coughs> black bear right. has been the one that's really uh, decimated some areas. Uh, of course, the black bear goes after primarily 
the, the young bees, the larva and so on, and he incidentally gets the honey, which I assume he finds rather tasty. That's the term honey hmm. bear. But, uh, but you now the, the, the whole honey bear notion is really kind of misleading because you say the bear is primarily after larva and young bees. For He'll what? eat honey, but that's not what he's up yeah. to primarily. If a, if, you, if a person reads about bears, they are pretty much omnivorous, and they like to roll over logs and get uh, grubs and so on out of the ground and everything, and that's what the bee larva happen to be. They're little, mm -hmm. they're little grubs. So I think it's pretty much of a, a misconception by most people. Mm -hmm. uh, but now a way. bear will literally tear a hive all to pieces. Absolutely. You get a 400-pound black bear and he can just knock a bee gum or a modern-day hive, just break it into smithereens and just well, you know, the old destruction. The old tales of bees tearing up hives uh, are very common, but I've read in my most recent issue of Progressive Farmer that it's becoming yeah. a problem all over again in North Carolina. In fact, uh -huh. that farmers are using electric fences to try to repel bears for the first time. Yeah. So it is a continuing problem. Yeah. How did old timers protect their hives from bears? Uh, for the most part, they either had their own dogs around or one of their neighbors had some good bear dogs and they'd put the bear dogs on the trail. Well, of course, they didn't pay attention to the seasons, the mm -hmm. hunting seasons at the time. And the bear was destroying their crop of, of honey, and they put the bears on the track, treed the bear, and shot him. Mm -hmm. So we've seen an elimination, for the most part, of black bears out of a large portion of Appalachia. Mm -hmm. uh, they are somewhat coming back mm -hmm. uh, in recent years, but beekeeping is very much uh, on the decline, generally speaking, right. as we were talking about earlier. Right. Dr. Burns, I wish we had more time. This has been a really exciting discussion for me. And I want to thank you. We'll have to talk about it again sometime. Yes, sir, I'd like that. But I do want to tell our audience that this has been a segment of our Appalachia. We've talked to Dr. Roland Burns about beekeeping in the Southern Mountains. And we hope you'll join us again when we take up another interesting aspect of our heritage and our culture in the Southern Mountains. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.